Cool, so uh, as Gene said, my name is Phil Freed, and uh, I'm a developer over at Paxata. And uh, I actually started off uh, not in software development, but I started studying uh, painting and printmaking. And so I come to this from a little bit of a, a different angle, and so that's why you know, I wanna share some of that uh, with you guys. Uh, it's something that's been pretty uh, helpful to me, uh, which is why I wanna share it. So I wanna start off right off the bat, uh, I wanna get this part out of the way. And that's uh, you know, just a basic working definition of creativity. And for our purposes, it's just, it's the production of something that is innovative and useful. And I think it's important to you know, point out that there's really those, both have to be there, right? If it's just novel, but not really useful for anything, what's the point? And if it's useful, but already, somebody's already built it, then why build it again? Uh, and uh, so we really want both of those things. And this is important. Um, all of these things that we use day to day, right? Everything from the you know, personal computer to the data structures and algorithms that we use, these are all creative productions. So we want, as, as developers, we want more of this, right? We can build upon our previous creative productions to, to get more. It's an awesome system. Uh, you know, we look at some of these things in the, the slide and, uh, you know, awesome stuff built by uh, amazing people. And, you know, this really points out one of the biggest uh, sort of uh, intuitive knowledges that, that we all bring to the table about creativity is we have this concept of creative people. And uh, so, you know, here we have uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Mozart, and uh, on the, the right is uh, Grace Hopper. And, uh, you know, these are amazing folks that have built awesome, awesome stuff. And uh, they're really, they're giants. And these people are all awesome, but they stand out in history because they're so rare. And the truth is that most creative productions aren't built by Leonardo da Vinci. Most of the stuff that we know and love, are, it's built by everybody here, right? Anybody can be creative. And you don't have to be da Vinci or Grace Hopper uh, in order to build something that is both innovative and useful. And so what this talk is really about, it's about empowering everybody here. And I, I wanna say that you know, our view of creativity, we, we, I don't wanna look at this fatalistically, right? Creativity is not something that's randomly doled out to a select few at birth. It's something that can be learned and nurtured and cultivated. And that's a really important idea. So to illustrate this, we're gonna take a step back in history. Uh, all of you in this room, you're all gonna come back in time with me. Uh, we're gonna go back in time to the early dark ages in England, and we're gonna talk about the history of the, the word creative. So uh, a long time ago, <laughs> we of course live in an anarcho-syndicalist commune, and uh, the, the creative is not even a word at this point in history. It's not a thing, it's not a concept at all. And you know, if we're all back in the, this time period, nine, so there's maybe about 100 people in this room, 95 of you are all just working morning till night on producing food. And what you do is you work morning till night and you produce barely enough food to survive. So we're all just kind of barely not dying. And what that means, since we have such a small surplus, so, so let's take an example, right? I'm uh, Dennis over here and I wanna try to innovate in how I do my farming, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this new idea for how do I plant my crops. I try it out and it doesn't work. We're screwed. <laughs> We're screwed. Um, this is a big problem. Uh, so the consequences are dire. Now a bit later in history, right, we, we move forward a couple hundred years and uh, the situation looks a little bit better. I have a little bit more of a surplus. This affords me the opportunity to be a little bit more experimental. This is awesome. And turns out 
at this point in history is when we see the first usages, the first glimmers of the concept of creative. Creative is, is, this is the first time creative is used as a word. So let's keep going. Uh, and we're now at the end of the 17th century and uh, we've got a pretty good surplus. This affords us the opportunity for all sorts of experimentation. We're having all kinds of fun here. Uh, at this point, we've got the Globe Theater. Uh, the Royal Academy for the Arts is just about to be founded. And the word creative at this point is now used to talk about the works of people. So back a couple hundred years before this, creative was just rarely a word and it only referred to the works of like the divine, right? It was like, it, it took some, uh, some powerful juju. Uh, and now so-called great men uh, can be creative. Uh, reflecting sort of the, the sexism of the time. But um, today, today is a totally different story. So now uh, we use the term creative for all sorts of things, right? We, we use the term creative to refer to people. Uh, you know, a, a kid does a drawing and you say, oh, that's very creative, right? I'll put it on the fridge. Um, and we even expand the usage of that word to mean things that are not necessarily great, right? When somebody says, oh, what do you think of my new tattoo? And you're like, oh, it's creative. Uh, and, and in fact, I mean, you could go to prison for creative accounting. Um, and it turns out that these negative connotations are there for a very good reason. The word creative has these connotations because it's risky. Most attempts at creativity fail. So this graph, this is probably the most important thing in uh, the whole talk. We're, we're getting to it right off the bat. Uh, and that's because it points out the relationship between risk and creativity. When risk is high, creativity is low. And when risk is low, creativity gets high. Uh, so it's pretty easy to see why, uh, you know, we consider the, the dark ages, the dark ages, Right? Because innovation was risky. People didn't want to be creative, you know, because of the whole death thing. <laughs> now, another important point about this is, you know, I, I want to try to think about it uh, in a slightly different way. You know, the, the creativity spectrum. And uh, so here, you know, on the one side, uh, we have a soldier who is soldiering. And uh, we have uh, George Clinton, who is George Clinton. And, uh, you know, I think it's important to point out that, okay, again, right, the risk thing, if the soldier tries something creative and it doesn't work out, the consequences are very, very dire. Uh, and if George Clinton tries to write a song and fails, he just throws that bit away and nobody ever hears it. He writes another one. It's no big deal, right? It costs, it's like nothing. Um, but the important thing to point out here is that this has nothing to do with them as people and everything to do with their pursuit, right? This soldier could be an immensely creative person, you know, back at home when, you know, he's doing something else. Maybe he's writing rust, I don't know. Um, and George Clinton, if he was, you know, off fighting some foreign war, might not be very creative about it. So uh, the key point is really just that the pursuit is what determines whether or not we're being creative. And so as software developers, of course, I mean, all of you probably know what's coming next, right? We are all the way over here, most of us. Um, so, <laughs> Gandalf, that, that picture just cracks me up every time. Um, so we think, you know, we work in one of the most pliable mediums ever created Right, code, especially if, if you have VCS, what's the, worst, what's the worst that can happen? Well, it's not quite that simple, is it? Right? Anybody here ever you know, write code that, uh, you know, for something that really just can't fail? <laughs> right? people, people writing code that's uh, running you know, rockets and, and cars and assembly lines and things like that. So if we want to increase creativity, what we need to do is we need to talk about risk. 
And we need to be open about this, have a good open discussion about the types of risk. Because it turns out risk is a little more nuanced than just like, oh, well, you, you live or you die, right? There's tons of different kinds of risk. So, you know, the obvious one is just like functional, right? It's possible that my code could be buggy, okay? Um, there's also, you know, most of us are, are writing code, you know, maybe for uh, a job, right? So there's financial risk to business. Uh, this happens especially when you have an established product, right? An established company that's got a pretty good revenue com coming in off of some core features, right? So it re doesn't really make a ton of sense to try to, you know, take risks in innovating on these core features that represent a major revenue stream, right? You're going to be a little more cautious about that. Um, delivery, you know, uh, you could maybe uh, take too long to deliver it. Um, there's risk there. Timing. So, uh, you know, a great example of dealing with all these risks is what we just heard about, Stylo. If you think about the approach to that project, right, it was not just like, oh, well, let's open up the uh, Firefox source tree and start hacking in there, right? It's just developed as a separate thing. And that was for a lot of reasons, not but uh, one of the major ones is it allowed those developers to be more creative. So um, apart from these things, right, this is kind of like, you know, institutional kind of, uh, you know, things to talk about with risk. Um, you know, this is a really important one. It gets uh, sort of uh, lost a lot of times when we talk about risk. You know, for us individually, are there social consequences of failure, right? So if I'm uh, live coding up here. Am I, like, how creative am I going to be? Uh, that's, that's, it's probably not going to work, right? Do you guys want to sit and watch me, uh, you know, fight compiler errors all the time or, or you know, write bugs? Um, yes. This is an important thing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is an important thing to talk about, though, and, and this really reflects on, you know, our engineering culture, right? What, is, what do we say culturally about this concept of failure and what is our, what is our relationship you know, as an institution with failure? Uh, and of course, personal. Um, this one, again, you know, it can be tough to talk about. We don't really have a lot of uh, language for that, but I think anybody here could understand the experience of you know, trying something that doesn't work Right? Maybe the business doesn't care. Maybe nobody else in the room is really worried about it. But if I personally have a hard time with that failure, then it's going to be hard for me to take those risks. And uh, this is another one, especially, you know, it gets often overlooked, you know, with, uh, you know, groups of engineers. You know, we like to talk about the technical side and the technical risks. This is a huge, huge barrier to actual creativity so, um, okay, we are engineers. We like to talk about the technical stuff. So let's do that, right? Um, let's talk about how we can reduce risk in code. There's a couple of pretty easy things that uh, you know, I'm sure are going to be fairly obvious to most people if you think about it a little bit. Right? If I want to be more creative in my, in, say, a refactoring, if I have unit tests, that goes a long way to help that. Right? I can you know, do whatever I want, and as long as my tests pass, if I'm confident, you know, this gives me the ability to be very creative. Uh, version control, I don't think anybody here is, is probably, like, everybody's using that. Uh, but I want to call out that it's really important that we do. This allows us to be creative. Uh, anybody have uh, branches sitting around on their side projects that were just like, <laughs> oh, I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> I've got a million of them. <laughs> um, and of course, you can write it in Rust. If I want to be creative about how I do something with regard to memory layout or parallelism, is Rust going to help me be more creative? Well, it's going to reduce risk, isn't it? It absolutely will. Uh, this is a, a great thing that, that you can do. Um, but it's also important, you know, to add a little bit of nuance to this, 
you know, this stuff, uh, it applies, it, it, it depends on the scenario, right? So there's a lot of different ways that we can be innovative. Um, and I have the Linux Penguin up here because Linux is, to me is a great example of this. When, when people think about creativity, another one of these sort of, uh, you know, the things that we intuitively think about, you know, we think about things that are functionally brand new. And Linux is a great example because, you know, it started out, GNU Linux was just a clone of something that already existed, right? It wasn't bringing new functionality. What it was bringing in terms of innovation is it was extremely innovative on the process of development. It was extremely innovative in how it engaged with developers and engaged with users. And we've seen a ton of value with that. Um, I don't think anybody would, would argue that, you know, that's really ultimately helped in then being for, so that they were able to build uh, creative and innovative features uh, because of that. So I, I don't think you can understate the importance of the relationship between risk and creativity. And I think, uh, you know, everybody here being very smart, you know, when you go in, back into your life and you look at a, a task and you say, I want to be more creative in how I solve this. You know, I want this, and I want the results to be awesome. You guys are all going to be able to think of ways that you can reduce risk. The solutions for that tend to be context dependent, but they also tend to be pretty easy to arrive at when you think about it. So moving on from the risk, um, I want to talk a little bit about creativity and some of the other things that kind of happen there, right? I, how many of you guys, uh, you know, you, you go to like a, a corporate training event or something and they say, we want to increase creativity, so uh, everybody go into a room and uh, paint pumpkins or uh, something like that. Uh, you know, I think the risk thing is far more important. Uh, straight up, if we want to increase creativity, we, first things we should do is talk about being able to reduce risk in all those different areas. Um, however, there is some other important stuff there too. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about how creativity works in terms of two sort of generic phases. And we'll call it ideation and evaluation. So coming up with creative ideas and then deciding, does this really have any merit? Uh, so I'm going to start by looking at just the, the ideation part. And, uh, you know, the Venn diagram here is uh, really just a, a pretty simple illustration of exactly what happens when we do this, right? When I come up with ideas in my mind, what's happening is that I'm looking, I'm drawing from my breadth of experience and memories, and I'm looking for overlaps, Right? Maybe I'm working on, uh, say I'm writing a, a garbage collector, uh, but uh, you know, in my past I have experience churning butter. And I come up with some crazy overlap between churning butter and garbage collecting. This is the kind of stuff that pops out. Um, and we want these ideas. At this phase, you know, we're not really deciding whether it has merit or not. And, and it's important, too, to recognize that at this point, we're also not, our, our ideas are not solutions, right? Our ideas may lead to solutions, but at this stage, you know, we're really just, we're looking for the overlaps and seeing, uh, you know, it pre presents a path that we may choose to follow. Uh, some people would say that you're generating like a mental representation of how you think about the problem. Um, so uh, we've got a number of things that we can do here to kind of help this out, right? We can indulge our curiosity. Everybody's here being enriched by this conference, learning about what other people are doing, even though it might ha not have anything to do with the specific task that you're working on. This is helping you be more creative. Diversity is a huge one, right? It, what's gonna kill our, our creativity? 
is if we came to a conference like this and it was all just people like us, right? Diversity is a huge thing. And this is great because, you know, it's not just, it's not just at an institutional level, right, but also personal. So where am I spending my time? When, when we're talking about this, this ideation phase, um, what we really need to do if we want to be more creative is we need to cultivate this breadth of experience. Um, I want to uh, just shout out a, a quick <laughs> word of warning here. Um, <laughs> I, I see a lot of you agree. Yeah. Um, so this is because it, it doesn't work because these are not, this is not the kind of stuff that we can really internalize that enriches our breadth of experience. Just sitting next to somebody who's different than me doesn't enrich my breadth of experience if I don't engage with them, if I don't work with them and talk with them. Uh, so we can't just fake it, right? So this is ideation. We've come up with, you know, the overlap between uh, butter churning and garbage collection. And no, I have no idea how I thought of that as an example. Um, let's just say it was creative and it's maybe not the best. <laughs> um, so after we come up with this, this idea, right, we have this, this structure, this representation of the problem, and we're going to follow this path. We then evaluate it. And here, it's, it's, the story's very different, right? This is one of the, another reason why these like, open floor plans and things like that don't work. Because here, what we really want is we want a depth of knowledge, not a breadth. A breadth of knowledge isn't necessarily as helpful here. We want the depth of knowledge, we want critical thinking, and we want focus. Most people uh, at this stage of the game uh, tend to be kind of quiet. Um, Part of these, uh, you know, these theories of creativity came about, the, the earliest ones, were just based on observations of you know, people that others thought of as creative. Right? People would see uh, you know, folks who they thought of as creative and they said, wow, you know, I happen to notice that uh, uh, Tolkien takes a walk every morning and kind of you know, gives himself time for some quiet contemplation. Uh, and so evaluation, what we're really doing is we're turning this over and deciding whether it's worth pursuing. Um, again, we don't have a full solution at this point. We've only got this kind of weird amorphous overlap between multiple ideas. And what happens is that this ends up circling back to this ideation phase. Right? So, so this is a cyclic thing and one informs the other. So I come up with my overlap with the garbage collection and the butter churning, and I turn it over in my mind for like five seconds, maybe, and I'm like, I don't think that's worth pursuing. <laughs> and, and the important thing, maybe it is, you know what, somebody in this room is gonna prove me wrong. <laughs> butter GC is gonna be the next big Java feature. <laughs> I, can, I can feel it coming. Um, but it, you know, it cycles back to innovation and it changes our worldview. So when I evaluate this idea and I say, you know what, that wasn't right, then it changes how I then think of future problems. Uh, so in this way, it kind of builds on itself. Um, you know, I have a, a picture of blind justice here and it, it's really a bit misleading because the truth is at this evaluation step, this is not simple. This is not a simple decision where we say, oh, this is going to work or this is not going to work. Um, you know, most of us as, as coders uh, have been in the experience where somebody comes up and asks you, well, can you make this work? And you think, well, yeah, I can get out the big hammer, right? We can get that square peg through a round hole if we push hard enough. And what this is really about is the, it's not whether or not it can technically be made to work. It's more about the principle of affordance. Anybody ever heard of the, the principle of affordance? It's a hugely important design principle. You guys are all going to understand it pretty quickly with this next image. So when we are talking about making something, 
You know, we take this, this idea that we have and we imagine what it's going to look like. And if you look at the doors over here, right, if I'm designing a door handle, I would say that the door handle on the right affords pulling. When you look at it, you immediately think, oh, I could pull that, right? And you would try to pull it. And how many people probably try to pull on that door without ever reading the sign? Probably happens all the time. I mean, I, I do it. <laughs> um, whereas the one on the left, you know, it, it's pretty obvious how it's supposed to be used. Um, so this isn't quite what can it technically do, but what does my idea afford? And it's a much more nuanced decision. So let's talk about this in code. When we're in code, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, I tend to, uh, I do most of my work with traits and unimplemented functions uh, before I ever write any line of executable code. And the reason for that is, is what this looks like in terms of the creative process here is I'm taking the ideas that are in my mind, we're starting to solidify a, gen, a general structure or a path, we're solidifying that into something that might be a solution, right? But what we wanna do here is we wanna figure out, is this really what I want and what does it afford? I wanna figure that out pretty quickly uh, because if it doesn't afford the things that I want, if it's not quite right, I wanna either scrap it or refine it as quickly as I can. So uh, unimplemented macro, macro, for me, this is like the most commonly used macro uh, in my code. I use this everywhere. Uh, unimplemented or just define a trait, right? Maybe it'll be a concrete type later, I don't know, but uh, just define a trait. Don't worry about the implementation, but be able to see what my design is going to afford. So this clearly affords uh, shooting the moon, uh, which is something that I'd love to do. Um, but you can also think about, you know, maybe Rust strings as an example, right? Rust strings afford slicing. Uh, this is a really useful thing. And so if you want to solve your problem with slices, if slices are going to be useful to you, then you want to just give yourself an API that affords the kind of things that you want. Um, now, the other part of this is that, again, right, this needs to be innovative and useful in order to really be what we are after. And again, we're circling back to ideation, right? So I'm gonna decide, well, this isn't quite right. I wanna change it a little bit, refine it, go back and forth. To do that, I need to decide whether or not this is gonna be considered a failure. And I use the term failure pretty lightly, right? In code, it is pretty light. You know, maybe not, maybe most of this is fine, but it's just missing a semicolon, MBD. Uh, but maybe I just need to add a few functions, change a few signatures, adjust things here and there. Either way, this requires me personally to say, this isn't right. And that can be hard. Um, so failure, I think, it's an unavoidable part of the creative process. And if we want to be creative, we have to get better at accepting failure. Um, I'm gonna tell you guys a, a real quick story uh, from when I was studying art. I came in one day and I, I turned in a painting and it wasn't very good. And uh, my art teacher, you could see it on my face, right? I, I came in, I like didn't even wanna show it to him. <laughs> I was like, this is a turd. And, uh, and, you know, he told me, look, you got to adjust your expectations. He said, I can see that, you know, you want to, to really be successful as an artist. And I'm going to tell you what that means. He said, what that means is that if you work very, very hard and you're very talented, that one in every seven of your paintings is going to be something that you actually feel good about. That, think about that. That's huge. Six failures for every success. And, and this was, you know, words from a professional artist. And so this is like the key thing that I think we can learn as developers from creative fields 
is that I had to learn how to fail. And this is a, a huge, huge thing uh, for me in being a developer, right? I learned how to fail, so failure is not a big deal. That allows me to cull those ideas pretty quickly. I can, I can be ruthless in evaluating my own ideas because the risk to me isn't as great. Um, uh, there's a great book about this uh, called Art and Fear. And uh, if you're interested in the topic, I definitely recommend it. It's real short. Uh, but it talks about that aspect of how do I deal with my own creative failures? And uh, if it helps, you know, you can always cross out art and write software. So uh, that's all I have. I hope for you guys that this was helpful and that you feel empowered to go out and be more creative. And uh, if there's uh, a question or anything that you have, uh, you know, come find me during lunch or, or afterwards. Uh, but thanks very much.